Welcome, everybody. This is week one of the professional machine learning and uh, machine learning engineer certification campaign. My name is Roman. I'm from GDG Lawrence. Uh, we have Kevin Kwan in the house, also my uh, co-organizer here at GDG Lawrence. Uh, thank you again so much for joining this session. This is week one of the PMLE or the, you know, short for a professional machine learning engineering certification study group. Um, we just wanted to thank everybody joining. Um, first of all, we want to thank all the co-hosting chapters. We have uh, nine co-hosting chapters in this session, but other sessions will be co-hosting from other uh, places. So thank you, everybody, uh, all those organizers uh, who are bringing their communities along and uh, you're helping us make this an amazing uh, campaign. So thank you, thank you to all the co-hosting chapters uh, for this campaign. Um, let's uh, hit it right away. So we're actually focusing on the professional machine learning engineer uh, certification. Let me just uh, pause that in there. Okay. So we're, we're focused on the professional ML engineering certification. Uh, this is a six week, uh, let's say program, if you, if you will, uh, with some, um, with uh, office sessions in between. And if you complete this program, uh, then you have enough knowledge to go take the certification. At the end, we're going to be raffling uh, uh, and providing vouchers. At the end of the of the whole campaign, we're going to be providing raff. Uh, uh, we're going to be raffling and giving uh, a voucher certification vouchers for those of you who complete the whole campaign, and you also can um, go and take the certification. Uh, you can also join, uh, uh, you know, or send us your, the, the public, uh, thank you, Kevin, for that. The, the public URL, this is the URL for our road to certification batch tracker. The batch tracker is a tool that we also developed, which allows us to keep track of how everybody's doing in their, uh, road to certification journey. Uh, and I see that a lot of people are, are really great on their way. Uh, I actually stepped it up myself. I kind of got bumped up. Kevin is way above me. I see other folks who are doing great in their journey towards getting the professional machine learning certification. Some of you have already completed it. So now if you've already completed all those, all these little uh, gold badges, you already have a, a, a voucher, let's say, you know, uh, already guaranteed. This is the the voucher, the again, the batch tracker that allows you to not only check which things you need to focus on, but it, it shows you how many badges you're, you know, towards getting that, uh, you know, the whole campaign completed. You can see your name. If your name is not there, please let us know. Send us your uh, public profile in uh, in in uh, Cloud Skills Boost. For example, if I go down and I see my bat, my profile, I can click on my public profile. This is what we need from you in order to be included to the batch tracker. So the batch tracker allows us to check where everybody is on their journey. If you don't know which uh, specific, let's say, session or a, a specific badge you need to tackle on a given week, just go to that week. For example, let's say session two, and you know that you have two badges to complete, TensorFlow on the Google Cloud and Feature en Engineering. You have to click on one of those, and then it takes you exactly to that um, to that path, to that quest, and then you complete it. So it's an amazing tool. Uh, we're going to be distributing more on that link. Uh, Kevin, thank you also for sharing uh, this week's uh, uh, set of slides that we're going to go over. Uh, and later also, we're going to do some engaging activities to see where we are. Uh, uh, on your on your journey towards getting their certification, kind of like warm you up on what the office hours are about. We do like hands-on activities. We also do exam prep uh, uh, questions, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of like prep tests for the certification questions. So why don't we start right away? If you have a question, please drop it in the chat. We have our team on deck ready to answer those questions. I may uh, pop back, uh, you know, uh, on and off uh, on the chat just to uh, check what you guys are asking. Uh, Ashish, the Slack invite will be dropped in a minute, uh, I believe. Um, uh, uh, if you don't see your 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 profile in the batch tracker, give us your public profile via the Slack, or you can drop it here. We can probably add you later. But if you don't see your name in there, is because uh, maybe you got into kind of like the second wave of the of the batch tracker. But you can just send us your profile. We can add you right away. So let's start. Uh, again, like I mentioned, this is where we are right now on week one. We started 
<clears throat> sorry, the pre-work, we started it two weeks ago, where we point you in the right direction, what things you needed to focus on to be in this week. If you want to be on track to get the certification along with us and prepare, like you be on track with this uh, program. So you should be right now at week one. Week one has two badges that we uh, are focused on, uh, that, that we focused on, which are how Google does machine learning and launching into machine learning. The batch tracker, if you if you don't know where, uh, if you haven't completed it yet, you can just come over here. You can click on these links and then it kind of tell, tells you what you need to focus on. But those are the two badges where you need to be in order to be uh, uh you know up to up to speed with us but that's okay if you're not there that's okay you still you know you got other things going on but that's okay you should then you know ramp up and make sure that then for the next two weeks you're gonna have then four badges that you need to complete so let's start so week one is based on these two badges how does uh google uh how does google machine how does google does machine learning and launching into machine learning so we're gonna start uh on kind of like a review of of this uh, uh, week uh, of, of the past week uh, session, and as a token of our appreciation for those of you who stay all the way till the end, we're gonna have a raffle of some uh, you know Google swag. So you pick one of these items, and we'll ship it right over to you. Kevin is gonna drop the link to the raffle. Um, you have to fill out your form. You have to uh, just your name and your email. If you're in the U.S. or Canada, you should be good to go. If you're not, uh, and and uh, the Google Cloud, unfortunately, the Google Merchandise Store doesn't ship uh, to other countries uh, and is, is make it really complex. But we will compensate you with a you know with a gift card. Okay, so U.S. and Canada, you can pick any uh, one of these if you win. If not, then we compensate you with a twenty-five dollar gift card. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, Kevin is going to drop the link to the. Uh, thank you uh, for those of you who are dropping your public profile. Kevin is going to grab those in a minute, and uh, we're going to drop the link to the raffle. Uh, if uh, Kevin hasn't done it yet, I think I have it here. And just uh, fill out this form uh, throughout. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Kevin already did it. Throughout the duration of this session, please fill out the form. That way you can win one of these cool raffle items. Okay, awesome. So let's start right away. If you have a questions, please drop it in the chat. Your your public profile, you can drop it in the chat. We'll grab it from there, and then we'll we'll take care of you. Okay. Awesome. So uh, this uh, week uh, content was based on how Google does machine learning. So this is about how to understand what it means uh, to be AI first. How Google does machine learning, leveraging Vertex AI. Um, if you completed the labs, you may have experienced a little bit of Vertex AI. Auto ML, maybe you tried a little bit of auto ML. We're going to describe like the best practices for machine learning and to end gain broad perspective on machine learning and where it can be used and kind of like frame a business use case as a machine learning problem. OK, so uh, we're going to cover we're going to kind of skim through the content of what uh, was about uh, what entailed week one. If you're not there yet, that's OK. This is going to be a review. But if you completed it, congrats. This is just a review of what you did on week one. Okay, perfect. So again, uh, they talk about uh, this whole, uh, you know, this whole week material talks about machine learning. Machine learning, again, is a way to derive predictive insights from data. So you need a lot of data to then derive some predictive insights. You do this using algorithms that are relatively general and applicable to a wide variety of data sets. You hear about, for example, like generative AI, you hit uh, like uh, uh, large language models. They're kind of like very uh, general. Uh, but they actually uh, cover a lot of ground. How do you use data today? People ask, uh, you know, perhaps you have a dashboard that, you know, as a business analyst and, you know, you're a decision maker on a daily basis, you want to kind of uh, grab your data and you want to make sense of it. Um, you know, this is what people, you know, that's an example of like backward looking use of your data. You have to like sit on a computer, look at a bunch of data. Uh, that's kind of like, again, backward looking of use of data, looking at historical data, uh, to create reports and dashboards. That's what people tend to mean when they talk about business intelligence, right? But in order to make decisions uh, around like predictive insights, uh, repeatable, you need machine learning. Like you want to know about, for example, like what, what would be, uh, let's say as a business owner, let's say you want to predict how much uh, inventory you need to uh, uh, buy instead of like just 
like buying a bunch of stuff and, and, and saving it somewhere. You want to have like some predictive analysis. And that's when machine learning comes into play. It's about making, making predictive decisions from data. So if you have a lot of data, then it's good uh, for you to do that. Again, this is just a very broad uh, and kind of like a, you know, just brushing through kind of like a, you know, reviewing of the whole ML and AI paradigm. So uh, artificial intelligence, what is it? It's a very common question asked, what is the difference between AI and machine learning? So one way to think about it, uh, AI is the discipline like physics. It's like a discipline like physics, right? Computer science. AI then has to do with the theory and methods to build machines that think and act like, and act like humans. Machine learning, and then it's a tool, as you can see there, machine learning is a tool set kind of like, you know, Newton's laws of mechanics, just as you can use Newton's laws to figure out how long it takes a ball to fall to the ground. If you drop it off of a cliff, you can use machine learning to solve certain kinds of AI problems, right? Uh, machines don't start out intelligent. They become intelligent because you make them intelligent. You train them, you give them a lot of examples. Um, and that's how they uh, kind of like become intelligent pretty much. Um, the first stage of machine learning is to train a model with examples, right? As you've seen a lot uh, out there, like how you give like a massive amount of data, a lot of examples. So then the machine, uh, that's kind of like the premise of machine learning. The form of machine learning that we'll be focused on in this, uh, for example, like in this session mostly, is called supervised learning. And in supervised learning, you start from examples. So you give it a lot of examples. You want your machine uh, to identify a bunch of cats. So you give it examples of cats, right? You want it to identify dogs. You give it a bunch of examples of dogs. So uh, an example consists of a label and an input, right? So for example, suppose you want to train an ML model to look at images and identify what's in those images, right? Like that's a very common use case. The true, the, the, the true answer is called the label. So let's say in the first image, it says cat. There's an image and there's a label, cat. You say, this is a cat, but this is a label, right? The second one, for example, you have the dog and then a label dog. The image itself, like the pixels for the image are the input to the model. Remember, a model doesn't understand what you're giving it. You have to give it, everything has to be kind of like um, converted into a, a numerical calculation, uh, uh, inputs and outputs, zeros and ones, bits and bytes, that way it understands it. So an image, just a, a bunch of bytes, a bunch of uh, like pixels on the image, that's the input to the model, right? The model itself then is a, a mathematical calculation, a mathematical function of a form that can be applied to a wide variety of problems. The models then, you know, used in ML are a bunch of adjustable parameters. And then that's how they get to like the final, uh, let's say, decision. Because by tweaking those parameters, then that's how they arrive at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at the answer pretty much. When you train the model, you make those adjustments to the model so that the outputs of the model, like I mentioned, the outputs of the mathematical function are as close as possible to the true answer for any given input. You give it all the examples. You say, identify me images of dogs. Here's a bunch of images of dogs, and I'm going to label each image uh, with the word dog. That way you know that this is a dog. And then when I give you another image of a, of a dog, then okay, so this is a dog, right? This is supervised learning. That's what they call that. Then after the model is trained, you can use it to predict the label of images uh, that it has never seen before. That is the way that you actually test whether your model was trained well. You give it a set of images, but then you, you test it with images that it hasn't seen before. In this example, in this case, like you're inputting this image to the trained model, but because the uh, you know the the this uh, network has been trained is correctly outputs that it was a cat because you gave it the right examples, you labeled it correctly. This is a supervised uh, a model, uh, um, you know, kind of exercise. And then it was able to, let's say, if you just give it an image with no label, it's supposed to do it correctly. Uh, and for example, now in this case, if you see the training, you give it like a, a like an image of a cat. But notice that the cat image on on this on this side is different from the one before it. That is how you actually test it. So it still works because the ML model uh, has generalized from the specific examples of cat's images that we showed it uh, to a more general idea of what a cat is and what a cat looks like. Right. The key of giving of making like an ML model generalize is data, lots of data. That way you say, okay, so this is a cat. It looks like a cat is very similar. You got to give it a bunch of images. Having label a data is then a precondition for successful ML. Otherwise, then you're going to have a bunch of garbage. So it's, it's important to realize that 
ML has two stages, like I mentioned, a training and inference. So inferencing is kind of like, again, you're, you're, you're trying to get predictions out of your model. Sometimes people refer to prediction as inference because prediction seems to imply a future state. Uh, in the case of images, like this case, we're not really predicting this is a cat. We're just inferring that it's a cat based on the pixel data, right? So it, it kind of like decomposes that. The, uh, you give it the pixel data and kind of uh, does its analysis or, or all the mathematical functions that it uh, and all the calculation that it performs. And then it infers that it's a cat based on that. But it's not like a human that I can see it and it's a cat. But if it's something that looks like a cat, the machine learning will still say, oh, this is a cat if you don't train it properly, right? Uh, some of you are already even using, uh, uh, you know, Google and uh, through Google, you're using a lot of the AI and ML, uh, um, let's say offerings, right? So training uh, deep neural networks, neural networks with lots of layer takes a lot of computing power. And that's what Google uh, kind of like gives us this, um, you know, ability, like to tap into that uh, vast amount of power uh, and knowledge that they have. Neural networks have enabled uh, dynamic and uh, dramatic improvements in, in, you know, really hard ML problems like language translation, image classification, speech understanding. Some of you already, like I said, using already uh, AI and ML without even realizing it. Look, um, like, for example, uh, you know, Gmail. Uh, ML is actually part of pretty much every Google product out there whether it's like YouTube uh, or Play or Chrome or Gmail or chat, like all of them, they all use ML uh, at the end. Um, they talk about deep learning, you know, how deep learning has come a long way in just the past few years, how it has exploded, but nothing uh, illustrates that better than uh, Google Photos, for example. Uh, and this is again, the, the, the Google product where you can upload uh, photos from your camera to the cloud. You don't need to tag it. As soon as you upload it, it kind of like auto tags it. The ML software tags the images for you so that then you can find images. But who did that? Well, the, the ML itself like auto tags those images. Uh, Google Translate is another example where it lets you point a phone camera at a street sign, for example, and then it translates the sign for you. And then it actually combines a couple of technologies. For example, it, it combines several models as opposed to just using the translation model or the image classification model. So, it, 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 for example, one model finds a sign, another one reads the sign using OCR. Uh, optical character recognition, and a third model then detects the language, and a fourth model then translate the sign, and a fifth model then superimposes translated text over that image, and perhaps maybe a sixth model um, selects the font to use and so on. So it's, it's, it's a lot that, you know, goes on behind the scenes that people maybe even take for granted, uh, but, but it's great, the, the all the power that uh, Google has and, and gives us a, and puts at our disposal so that we can leverage all these tools. Um, an easy way to uh, add ML to your applications uh, is to take advantage of pre-trained models. So you don't, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Some of us, some of folks like me, I'm a software engineer. I'm not a data scientist, but I love the fact that I can tap into already pre-trained models to develop applications without me, without me even training any models, uh, uh, creating a RESTful API to expose that trained model, and then I can uh, uh, do predictions against it. No, I, I love that I can roll like one quick uh, um, uh, model. I can just put it behind a, a, a RESTful endpoint, and then I can develop applications for it. I can even add them to my own mobile applications, uh, like run them locally and do a lot of cool things. There's a bunch of, uh, again, this, these are some of the like off the shelf solutions for cases where you don't need to build your own models, which is pretty, uh, pretty convenient. Uh, they also mention a lot of the, again, the, again, the pre-trained machine learning services available on the Google cloud. You have Vertex AI. We're going to talk about Vertex AI and TensorFlow, uh, uh, but you have like Vision API, Speech API, the jobs API, which I recently found out about it. Then you have the natural language API, translation API, of course, just a bunch of uh, already, you know, pre-trained uh, available services that you can just kind of like off the shelf things that you can just pick and choose and you can combine them to build like really robust applications. They mentioned here, these are like the main four points on how you, for example, like when you're collecting data to build your models, like kind of like a four, uh, you know, must uh, must go uh, main points about ML, like collecting data uh, is often the longest and hardest part of an ML project. 
and the one most likely to fail. That's kind of true. Uh, manually analysis helps you fail fast and try new ideas in a more agile way. So that is kind of like you doing like prototyping and whatnot. Also to build a good model, you have to know your data. You have to know, for example, where it comes from, whether it's, uh, it's like very convoluted. You, you want to kind of like parse it and know what data you're feeding into the model. Uh, and of course, ML is a journey towards automation and scale. You have to uh, take it through the journey, through the motions. Once you then you're, you're fe you feel comfortable uh, uh, and then you can automate a lot of things and scale that automation. And then you can uh, do a lot of things, uh, let's say in your company as a business leader, and you can um, um, increase productivity in your company and whatnot. Awesome. Uh, again, th this is kind of like they mentioned a little bit of like how software is developed nowadays, like software engineers write program rules. Remember, you have to say if this, then else, then do this. You kind of have to create the rules. But in machine learning, machine learning figures out the program rules. So we're kind of, you know, you're going to pull out the software engineer and instead we're going to use another computer that is only going to see going to see many, many examples, many inputs paired with a desired output. You give it the input, you give it the output. You say, this is what I want. You figure it out and then you tell me when I give you another example uh, whether what I want is, is true or not. So and from these, then again, that computer will figure out what the best program is to write. So it does it internally with the algorithms um, that, that it that it contains. They mentioned also like the 10 top ML pitfalls that you have that you must avoid when you're in this ML journey. Whenever you're trying to automate and scale, uh, let's say, a business process and you want to automate it. They mentioned a couple of things. This is all again in the in this. This is all not only in the slides, but it's also in all the videos. They explain this in much deeper, uh, uh, you know, in more details. So you should be able to kind of like go by this like 10 ML pitfalls, which is very important to, to go by. Um, have an issue scrolling down on the batch tracker, uh, the, the batch tracker, make sure that you're like hundred percent on the, on the view of your page. And then if you just use your wheel, you should be able to scroll up and down. So make sure if this is not mobile friendly, it's only, uh, uh, desktop friendly. So make sure to, that, that you can like scroll up and down on the batch tracker. Awesome. Let's continue. They mentioned uh, a lot about the, um, um, the, for example, like the path to ML, the five phases uh, to do ML, starting from, uh, for example, like, you know, how a task or a business uh, process that is in the, uh, that's the individual contributor, like a person uh, doing a task. Uh, performed by a single person. That is the individual contributor. Then, you know, they usually we start to delegate and then we put multiple people uh, uh, who are all performing the same task in parallel. Then that's the delegation. Then you get to the digitization, which is a bit of marketing buzzword. But what it means is that we take the core that is repeatable, that the repeatable part of the task or, you know, in general, digitization is then that part of automation. Uh, we know we think of automation econ economically as a way to trade upfront investment for a lower marginal cost uh, or run rate. Uh, automation gets us a lot of things. And maybe you're thinking, uh, wait, but uh, don't we, we don't, you know, we don't want to get rid of people. But you're right. You don't want to get rid of people, but you want to scale their impact. You want to make them more productive. Uh, you you want to give your users a higher quality of service. Uh, and automation is a great way to do that business process, of course, and then we automate it with computers. You still need to have a person uh, kind of like in, in the middle still. And what happens then? Then you move, for example, to big data and analytics. Here, you're going to use a lot of data to build operational and user insights. Uh, you know, you, you won't be able to train your ML algorithm because your data isn't clean and organized. If you can make, for example, like a, you know, like a histogram of your data, your algorithm can effectively make that histogram either. So, uh, again, you need to make sure that, uh, you know, you, you want to be able to do big data and analytics for that then when you get to the machine learning aspect which is step five uh you know this is the last phase in the path of ml this is where we use all the data from the previous steps and we automatically start to improve these computer processes so make sure to go uh uh you know go through through that of course they mention again the how to build a machine learning model in production they identify again some of those steps and but at the end this is what i wanted to mention one additional step which is a deploy monitor and maintain uh and again after the deployment the model should be monitored and maintained uh typically we call the process of determining whether the model is ready for production the proof of concept 
uh, or experimentation. So you want to put it in the cloud. You want to uh, put it in front of people. You want to maybe put it behind a behind a RESTful API. You want to battle test it. But make sure that you actually kind of go through all of these steps, uh, identifying the business goal, acquire the data, building the model, training the model, evaluating it, and then deploy, uh, monitor, and maintain your model. Um, they talk about ML application, uh, for example, like in this particular case, after you move from experimentation to production, it requires uh, packaging, deploying and monitoring your model. What do you do with your model? As you package your code for production, then you need to install, for example, like either a package, uh, for example, let's say in Python, um, out of your predictive model so that then you can tap into, into the model itself, give it input, get output. A trained model can be deployed in various ways. The way that I've done it, that I've actually have experience doing it, is for example on a user's mobile device. You can have like a TensorFlow, mo uh, a TensorFlow light model. You can bring it into your mobile application. You can package it with your mobile application. You can make it as a web service, like in a container, like let's say a cloud run container or a Docker container uh, uh, running on a cluster. Then you set up endpoints. Um, um, so it was kind of like so that you can allow your apps to, to serve predictions. And that also allows other people even to tap into the models that you've built. So, um, for example, like you have a web application in the front end that then talks to us a RESTful API behind that RESTful API. Then you may have a model deployed in a container and so on. So it's, it's kind of like the common way to go about it. Uh, they talk about, you know, a little bit of like you know what is a data set they mentioned how how it is created uh also how the model uh is trained based on that data set so there's a lot of that in week one so make sure to go over where do i find the syllabus for this campaign kevin is going to drop the link to the slides all these slides that you're seeing here they will be available uh right now in just a minute um so uh and then you should be able to just go exactly to see but remember all of this is in better resolution and with more details in the video. So you got to watch week one, okay? This is just skimming through the content, kind of like going uh, as a review of what, what was covered, okay? Um, we talked about the, the different training methods, AutoML and custom training. AutoML lets you create and train a model with minimal technical effort. I myself, I'm not a data scientist, I'm not an ML expert, but I like to use a lot of AutoML because even if you want flexibility of a custom training application, you can use AutoML to quickly prototype models and then explore, uh, explore new data sets before investing in development or like going through the motions of actually doing custom training. But you can then do custom training to create a training application optimized for your target outcome. This is the best way to go if you truly want to maintain complete control over you know, your application functionality and whatnot. Vertex AI, which is, again, one of my favorite things, uh, uh, the new things that came out uh, this year, Vertex AI integrates then the ML offerings across Google Cloud into a seamless development experience. Uh, it allows you, again, uh, previously models trained with AutoML and custom models were accessible via separate services. Now Vertex AI kind of brings it all together and it combines both into a single API along with other new products. And we're going to show those in a minute. So again, Vertex AI, it provides libraries uh, from for some languages to help you make calls to the Vertex AI API. So you can deploy like your own models, for example, into Vertex AI, and you can even uh, create endpoints so that people can talk to you, uh, uh, they can tap into your models and you don't have to, you know, it kind of like, it's like a fully managed environment so that you can deploy your own um, Vertex AI models, your own custom models or uh, uh, auto ML model. So the client libraries provide an optimized developer experience uh, by using each supported language's natural conventions and styles. I've used uh, Vertex AI through Firebase. Uh, there's also like packages for Flutter, like the, the 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 framework, the UI framework, so that you can build applications and then tap into the cloud. You don't need to be a data scientist. You don't need to be, uh, you know, the uh, you know, at the top of your game when it comes to machine learning, and you can even build amazing experiences for your users. Then when you're using uh, Google API client libraries, you build representations of the resources and objects used by the API. 
This is easier and requires less code, of course, than working directly with HTTP requests. Like you have to then know how to pass things. No, the uh, uh, it makes it really easy and you should be able to see it if you take a look at Vertex AI in the Google Cloud. Um, they talk about, again, um, for example, like all the offerings about um, Vertex AI, what they offer uh, as far as like ML and whatnot. They talk a lot about deep learning, how deep learning v, like VM images. They have v, they have deep learning VM images. They have virtual machines optimized for data science and machine learning tasks. And you don't have to like create your own. You don't know how to you, you don't know how to set it up. They already have it for you pre-created. All images come with uh, you know key ML frameworks already pre-installed. It makes it easy for you. Uh, they talk about uh, TensorFlow Enterprise. Uh, you know, you can, and they have already like GPUs. Uh, you can use them out of the box again on instances with GPUs, TPUs to accelerate your data processing tasks. So uh, again, they kind of like containerize it so that you can then deploy it much quicker. Um, and they have like Docker containers, again, like I mentioned, with key data science frameworks, libraries and tools already pre-installed. And they have, they provide you with a performance optimized, consistent environments that can help you prototype and implement workflows quickly. You, you don't have to get uh, bogged down by the details of setting up virtual machines optimized for machine learning. You could just pick one of those and you can hit the ground running right away. They talk about this the very important topic about the equality of opportunity approach. Uh, it is pretty interesting. They talk about, for example, like how uh, how they can make uh, uh, predictions. Let's say on uh, let's say a group of people based on demographics, but trying to be, uh, for example, like how uh, in this demographics, like this group of people, what is their desired outcome, or how can you predict? Uh, uh, a salary or like a uh, uh, for a group of individuals, regardless of of their you know uh, let's say where they're from or whatever, but leveling the playing field and having an equal chance of selection. It's very interesting. If you read this, is is something very important and something that uh, AI and ML is trying to solve, kind of like leveling the playing field, not being not being biased towards uh, uh, you know one one you know. Uh, demographic or another, uh, leveling the playing field, be, things being equal, uh, how can you solve a problem? So it's very interesting. Uh, they talk about how all machine learning starts with uh, a business requirement, academic requirement, or problem that you're trying to solve. So you start from there. You start from a business problem, something that you want to solve, right? Sorry. Uh, they talk about the difference between machine learning and statistics, how uh, let's say machine learning, you want you want to have lots and lots of data. You want to use your data sets for training, uh, and, and testing and validating. So you'll have to split it up if you have a big data set. Uh, but then in statistics, you don't need to split your data. You take what you're given and then you use it. Uh, also in machine learning, you keep the outliers or those data points that stray outside of all the other data points, and then you build models for them. So. They talk a lot about these things like machine learning versus statistics. It's very interesting. They also talk about how you, um, let's say, you know, within the subset of machine learning models, uh, deep learning is usually implementing as a form of supervised learning, like we mentioned. Uh, deep learning requires large data sets, while regular machine learning allows you to train on, sm <clears throat> on smaller data sets. And because deep learning uses large data sets, uh, to glean patterns, it provides higher accuracy than other because the more examples that you give it, then it learns more, it has more knowledge. Uh, but it also means that deep learning takes longer to train and you need more uh, computing resources for that. In terms of hardware, you can train your ML model on a CPU while you need a GPU to train a deep learning model given a large data set. Uh, also, you have more control over tuning the uh, the hyperparameters, what they call the hyperparameters. Again, the number of layers is referred to as the hyperparameter. So you have more control over uh, like tuning the hyperparameters with deep learning than with other forms of uh, machine learning. And again, remember, machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. It's something underneath machine learning, kind of like computer vision is, you know, speech recognition, natural language processing, natural language understanding and whatnot. Uh, and of course, the goal of ML is to make computers learn from the data that you give it, plain and simple. Uh, they talk about like how you have to split your data set. 
um, how you how you uh, you can use, for example, Jupyter notebooks uh, to load data sets into a pandas data frame. They talk a lot about like pandas, how pandas is like one of those very popular Python packages that allow you to uh, like do machine learning much easier. And there's, there's like NumPy, Scikit-learn. There's a bunch of those packages that you should know uh, as a data scientist or if you're involved into training your models, building your own data sets uh, and whatnot. So you, you need to get familiar uh, with that. Uh, they talk in in Vertex AI. They they take you through a series of steps. For example, if you go to Vertex AI and you launch Vertex AI, it takes you through the steps on how you kind of like create a data set. How you want to train your model. You start first by creating a data set. Uh, then you can select the data type and objective. For example, you want to, what do you want to do? You want to do some forecasting. You want to do either regression or classification. You want to do some image. Uh, is tabular? Is text? Is video? You pick the data the data type, right? Third step, then you have to upload the data, whether it's in CSV, they, they ask you like what type of data it is. Um, and step four, you train the model. You see, it's very simple. It takes you through a wizard. You don't have to do any crazy, crazy things to like train your model. So Vertex AI, you're going to become a huge fan of it if you get into it. And even some of the labs are actually going to show you how to do that. Then at the end, you get like an email, which is pretty cool. Remember, uh, a Vertex AI, and then when you're learning, when you're training deep learning models with a large data set, it actually takes a long time. In some of the labs, I don't know if you remember, there was one that took two hours. I literally left it running, went to the supermarket, came back, and it was still running. And I'm like, oh, this is crazy. Uh, but, but you get an email. This is the cool thing. You get an email saying, Vertex AI, finished training your model. So something like that, you know, it's very convenient. And the Google is, they already automate that for you. Uh, they talk about how without auto ML, you kind of, let's say if you want to do your own, uh, you know, training yourself and you want to build uh, your own uh, uh, models, this is kind of like how you go about it. You have to bring your raw data, extract the data, do ETL, analyze it, prepare it. Then you have to do training, evaluation, validation, deploy it and all of that without auto ML, right? Now this is where Vertex AI then fits in. They do all of this for you and it manages all the stages for you. So the data set, all you have to do is just upload your data. They even sometimes it actually even um, kind of like, like you saw, for example, like it auto tax it for you in certain cases. You can use BigQuery. We're going to mention a little bit of that. Uh, but you can, it takes you through all those stages of the ML workflow very seamlessly without you having to uh, do it like a lot of heavy lifting, right? Uh, also, they tell you when to use AutoML and when to use custom training. So there are different uh, uh, ways on on how to go about it. For example, like uh, uh, you do you uh, for example, AutoML doesn't require uh, data science expertise, while for custom training, yes, uh, you don't need coding if you want to do auto ml so no programming ability is required um the time to train the model in auto ml is very lower it's higher in custom training because again more data preparation is required you have to do all that yourself uh, you must target one of the auto ml's predefined objectives if you're on auto ml um there's a bunch of other like pros and cons which is pretty cool so you should take a look at that they mentioned how AutoML tables use your data set and how even just evaluating AutoML models begins again with understanding how AutoML tables uh, uses your data set. You give it your data set, whichever format, AutoML identifies the type of format it is, and then your data set will be split into training, validation, and testing. That kind of like the, the, the rule of thumb for this is like 80, 10, 10. 80 day, 80% 80 of your data for training, 10 for validation, 10% for testing. Uh, but you can manually adjust these values, but this is kind of like the golden rule, right? Um, some people are asking the question, so you're limited in terms of using an end-to-end -end platform for machine learning, TensorFlow, uh, PyTorch, and Keras. As far as like an end-to-end -end platform, it, yes. So you you have like a set of, uh, you, you could go on your own and do your, your own thing. But as far as like Google, you either have to then use the machines that they have available and then you bring your own but as far as like auto ml and 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 vertex ai you have to kind of like uh, use the libraries that they have available for you 
they talk about the vast majority of your data should be in the training because you want to truly train your models appropriately. This is the data that your model sees during training. So the, the training phase should be like your top priority. And again, it's used to learn the parameters of the model, namely the weights of, or connections between uh, the nodes in your neural network. Remember when they talk about the neural network, it's kind of like simulating the brain. You have neur neurons, like the cells in your brain, and the, the connections between the nodes or between the the, neur the neurons are called the weights. And those are the things that um, you kind of like have to adjust. They talk about then the validation set, which is kind of like the development set, which is during uh, uh, used during the training process. After the model uh, learning framework incorporates your training data during each iteration of the training process, then it uses the performance on the validation of uh, the validation set to tune the model's hyperparameters, which are the variables that specify the model structure. Um, they talk again a, a lot about how you know the hyperparameters, those uh, connections, uh, and all of that. They talk to, uh, the test set again. They talk about the test set, which is not involved in training in training process at all. This is what you use to then um, kind of like test your application or your model, the performance of your model uh, on the test set, which is intended to give you a pretty good idea on how your model will perform on real world data. So you make sure that your test set, your, your model has not seen that data at all. That is the best way to test the performance of your model. They, they, you need to test your model, make sure to do that. Uh, and you, of course, eventually you deploy it. And those are the things that, again, to test your model, you first need to deploy it, which it means you need to set up endpoints. Like I mentioned before, endpoints are those machine learning models made available for online prediction requests. And the way that you do it, they're very useful for timely predictions for many users, let's say in response to an application request. You can also request batch predictions if you don't need immediate results. And when you're satisfied with your model's performance, then you can use it, uh, which is pretty good. Then they talk about like batch prediction, online prediction, how you could do make prediction requests at once. Um, it is asynchronous um, and online prediction. Then you deploy it behind a RESTful API and then you can just make um, requests. Uh, you know, it will quickly return a prediction, but only access one prediction request per API because you need to make a call. You make a request, you get a response. Simple as that. BigQuery ML is huge. I love BigQuery and BigQuery ML again uh, uh, allows you to achieve those goals like with its, this four steps. You know, you create a model, specifying your model type. Uh, is anybody, I, I, hear, I think I hear some background, uh, can make sure that everybody's muted. Um, so again, you first need to uh, write a SQL query to extract the training data from BigQuery, of course. Uh, second, then you create the model, specifying the model type, all with BigQuery. I did it in one of the labs. It was pretty simple. Then you evaluate the model, um, and then you predict and classify against it. It's like making a SQL queries against your, your data set. I still hear like some background. Uh, please make sure to uh, mute. Uh, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, let's make sure to uh, mute mute yourselves, please. Uh, Kevin, can you take care of that? Please make sure that everybody's muted. Uh, because I hear. Don't fit me. Almost. They don't fit me anymore. Yeah, let's make sure to uh, be muted, please. Uh, everybody. Yeah, I'm checking right now. Awesome. Thank you. Let's uh, continue. So again, we talked. Uh, they talked about how ML models are mathematical functions. We've already talked about that. Uh, they talk about the high parameters, hyperparameters, how a parameter is a real val uh, value variable that changes during model training, while a hyperparameter is a setting that we said before training, which doesn't change afterwards. So those are things that you will know during training, during you know building your ML models and whatnot. This is one of the things that I, I when I saw during the during this uh, session. I was like, I'm so glad that I paid attention during algebra and linear algebra and calculus. Because when I saw this, I'm like, okay, you see, that's what my teacher was like. See, you need to pay attention. This was why. <laughs> so again, you see like how these uh, uh, equations, how this, um, uh, how you can see, for example, like these uh, formulas and this mathematical equations come into play. Um, you know, linear models, uh, again, they were one of the first sort of ML models and they remain an important and widely used class of models today. And if you see here, for example, like this, uh, you know, visually, 
um, kind of like this looks like a line in 2D space. And the formula used to model the relationship is just simply Y equals B plus X times M. And then, you know, where uh, B captures, uh, you know, B, you know, M captures the amount of change uh, we observe in our label in response to a small change in our feature. And then you simply use the formula B plus M times X to get your prediction Y, you know, and stuff like that. But it's, it's, it's very, you know, it is like a simple example, of course, of a, you know, very simple linear model. But then if you get to something like this, which is uh, like a deep neural network with hidden layers in between uh, is a, a lot more complex, of course. So you can think of a neural network as a hierarchy of features. Uh, and this idea of taking inputs and then transform, transforming them in complex ways uh, before ultimately classifying them. It's a typical you know, neural network, and it represents a significant departure from the approach used, used very classically in machine learning, right? They talk about a confusion matrix. This was pretty cool. I don't know if you guys saw this during the video, but they talk about like, this is a matrix that again, you may have seen before uh, when we discuss inclusive ML and facial recognition in, 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 you know, in some, in some videos that you may have seen out there. But in this example, uh, you know, they look at a face detection ML model, for example, which incorrectly predicted a statue of a human as a human face, but it's not a human, it's a statue. That's what's called a false positive but also missed an actual phase in the data set that it was given to it because it was obscure with some winter clothing or some snow falling. And, it, and this is called a false negative. So it didn't detect the face when there was a face, but then it detected something that looked like a face and, it, and those are called again, false negatives, false positives. When you use a confusion matrix like this, uh, it will allow you to quantify and assess the performance of your classification model. So this is very important to, to keep in mind. They talk about how you evaluate your final model. They talk about, again, developing the ML model software on the entire data set can be expensive, like I mentioned, but you want to start from a smaller sample. That's why, uh, for example, using AutoML is good. And that's it, guys. So that's pretty much uh, what we did on week one. Make sure to then uh, focus on those two. For those of you who didn't complete week one, make sure to complete those two. The How does machine, uh, again, this is the, one of the badges that, again, uh, uh, we talked a lot about, the how Google does machine learning. You make sure to get this badge. Then the other one is launching into machine learning. Everything that I mentioned just now is all included there. So it's like, oh, Roman was saying something. No, no, everything, everything. I took it from here, from all the videos and all the slides and whatnot. So this is where you need to be at right now, week, uh, uh, session one, completing these two badges, everything that I mentioned, uh, Kevin just dropped it in the, in the chat, the link to these slides. And now, the next two weeks now, uh, um, for our next session, which will be in August 21st, so now you will focus on session on on session two, which has TensorFlow on the Google Cloud and feature engineering. So for the next two weeks, if you didn't complete session one, now you have four badges that you need to complete. That's why I said you need to make sure to try to keep up with the session. That way, again, you don't have so much to. How do I get access to these sessions? So uh, Joel, um, um, again, first they're available in the um, in the batch tracker. It's available in the slides, and then you see it right there. So week one, those are the two badges that you need to tackle. Week two, uh, the, the two badges. Uh, Mark, we don't have search uh, 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 available in the batch tracker. It's just, a, it's just a list, and then you can just scroll down. If your name is not there, that means you were not added. So make sure to give us your public profile, and then we'll add you accordingly how do we get yeah you can actually use the browser to search and see if find yeah. your name there. i mean can, can we continue dropping the links people the links get lost in the chat so let's drop the link to the slack channel let's drop the link to the slides again uh and again if you want to sign up for the public uh uh for the uh slack uh for the batch tracker you can just drop your public profile you know, we will continue adding more folks in here, but this is the first batch of both. So if your name is not there, that's okay. It's because you were not added. We can add you there. Make sure again to, uh, Kevin is going to drop the link of the Slack and also the link to the slides because you need to catch up. We need to be on week two 
and that's what you need to focus on. So week two now is going to be, um, like I mentioned, TensorFlow on the Google Cloud, feature engineering. Nothing that I'm saying right now is strange. Everything is available in the videos that uh, encompasses week one. In, uh, week one, But now you have a little bit of heavy lifting because you need to focus on week two. But for those of you, that's okay. If you just want to go through your own motions, uh, go at your own pace, that's totally fine. But we will be on week two for the August uh, 21st session. Okay, for the August 21st session, we'll be on week two focusing focusing and reviewing those two um, those two badges. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, I never got an email calendar alert for the session two. Uh, Hadid, that's kind of weird. I uh, you uh, Make sure they just sign up for all the sessions, but it's Bevy that does that, not us. So we're going to have to either take it up with Bevy, make sure that they are actually sending the sending the, the notifications. But I get it every time. I get it one day before. I got it like the week uh, in between. I think I even got one earlier. So make sure that your email is correct. Make sure that it's not going to spam or anything. But Bevy is the one doing those automated emails. But 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 yes, uh, if you go to the batch tracker and you don't have those uh, those notifications here, the batch tracker tells you exactly where is the next one. August 21st, September 4th, and so on. And if you don't have the slides here, you know, for example, for everyone, these are the things that you need to focus on. You just click on one of those and then you can immediately do the videos, okay? Perfect. So I hope that let's drop one uh, one more time, Kevin. The link actually, I think I have it right now. Let's drop the link of the raffle. We're gonna do the raffle in a in a minute. So if you want to be included in the raffle to get one item from the Google Cloud merchandise, uh, please add your name to the form. While we wrap up uh, the session, uh, does anybody have any questions before we proceed to the uh, you know? just kind of like a warm up on what the office hours will be. Just wanted to show you what the office hours entail. What are they're going to start after session two? We don't have uh, office hours uh, in the week in between session one and session two. They're going to start after session two. They're not here, by the way, in the batch tracker because they're, these are more informal. We're going to practice exam questions. Uh, we're going to do hands on activities is outside of these sessions. Uh, is there an exam voucher provided at the end? Yes. If you complete, William, if you complete all of the badges and you're like this, like per deep, like all of the badges complete, you get a voucher at the end. That is correct. What is the course website? Uh, which course in particular? Because uh, we are distributing the link of the slides. Cloud Skills Boost gives you all the courses, all the videos and all the, and all the labs. They are available in uh, Cloud Skills Boost. I'm gonna drop the link again. These are where all the sessions are. Like if you look at this slide, this is what you need to complete week, week one through six in order to get a, a voucher at the end. Um, this path we're doing is a non-STD one. <laughs> That's a good one. Okay, uh, um, Adrian, uh, okay, so let's, uh, uh, maybe you can ping me uh, offline we're going to drop the link to the slack channel can you uh, drop the link to the slack channel if anybody wants to add maybe ask any questions even in spanish i'll be able to answer in the chat but uh for the sake of the you know the global team um you know we're um you know we're going to continue with in english for now so let's um but you can join our slack channel we can talk through there you can send me a message that's totally fine Awesome. And yeah, uh, thank you, Lewis. That's how you get on Slack. Uh, so in the office hours, this is what we're going to be doing. And I'm going to just uh, show you real quick. How is it that uh, week, uh, let's say the office hours will do. And let me show you, uh, for example, here how it goes. So what we're going to do on the office hours is pretty much like this. So we're going to uh, show you, we're going to do like uh, exam questions. So if you want to, let, let's try, for example, like a few questions just so that I can show you how it goes. So if anybody wants to join uh, on a on a small warm up on how the office hours will be, we're going to be going through exam questions, not only from the material that is in there, but also real exam questions that we've collected from out there. And then we're going to practice it among us. Right. So the way that you do it is you're going to join a session that we create something like this. 
let's say you go to slido.com with this code and we're going to ask questions people answer and then we see how we are doing then you're going to learn along with us and we uh, we practice the exam questions this is a way for you to uh, not only get more proficient in in the content that we're that we're giving out you also practice real exam questions, you get familiar with how the exam taking experience is. So this is pretty much what we uh, uh, like to do. So uh, for example, let me uh, let me start the quiz. Let me see, so for, so for people to join. So you can just join uh, the quiz at slido.com with the code 1704235. Let's just do a couple of questions. It's just to show you how the the let's say the office hours experience will be we do like half hour of hands-on uh hands-on activities but then the other half we do exam questions like this so let's see let's just join for a few minutes because then the last minute we'll devote it for the raffle so make sure that you join while i uh do other things here i'm just going to give you a minute for folks to join so let me um I'll just give you a minute to join. We're just going to go through a few questions. Not that many. It's just so that you get familiar with, again, like I mentioned, the experience of, um, you know, taking the exam and the reviews that we're going to be doing. Okay. So join the quiz. I'm going to give you just a few more seconds. Let's do 30 seconds and then we join. Okay. 30 seconds and then we join. Uh, and then we're going to do the raffle uh, of the folks. Make sure to also add your name to the raffle. Uh, let's do 30 more seconds on the clock and then we're going to start the quiz and we, we're going to show you again how the uh, kind of like, you know, we, we start with this. Okay. So uh, 10 more seconds to join, 10 more seconds to join. And then we're going to start a little bit on the quiz. Okay. So let's do like five questions and then let's see how it goes. Okay. So we're going to start the quiz um, right now. I'm going to hit start and now we should be able to see the question. So for example, uh, whenever we give you a question like this, and if we say, which of the following are best practices for data preparation? All of this is coming from the videos and the content from the, from the, from the cloud skills boost from week one, everything is from week one. So let's say uh, which of the following are best practices for data preparation? Is it avoid training, serving skew, provide a time signal, avoid target leakage, or all options are correct. So why do people, um, you know, maybe what, what do you guys think is the answer so i see that a lot of people are kind of leaning towards all options are correct and that is correct all the options are correct for data preparation you need to avoid training serving skew provide a time signal and avoid target leakage so i see that you guys are doing pretty good how about this question let's say what would you use to replace user input by machine learning remember what we talked about business goals so what is it that you replace user input by machine learning? Is it neural networks? Is it labeled data, pre-trained models, or all options are correct? So what do you replace out of a business uh, process with machine learning, by machine learning? So what do you do? People say labeled data, pre-trained models, or all options are correct. So this goes to show that you need to practice the week one because it's actually pre-trained models. So this is actually what gets replaced, uh, replaces user input by machine learning. Let's try another one. Which of the following is not part of the ML training phase? If you go through the material of week one, good, this is a review. If not, this is what you will be seeing in week one. So let's try this one. Which of the following is not part of the ML training phase? Is it evaluating? creating the model, data management, or connecting neural networks? What is not part of the training phase? Let's see what people say. Evaluating the models, creating the models, data management, or connecting neural networks. So the answer is, of course, connecting neural networks. That's not part of the training phase. But uh, all, all those other ones are. In the last one, let's try this last one so that we can do the raffle. So what is the most efficient way to transcribe speech? If you guys remember or even how uh, even how you think, uh, let's say, Google performs, like how, how you transcribe speech, let's say you're talking, how does it do it? Uh, you collect audio data, train it and predict with it or uses a dictionary website for a partial transcription, then uses ML to fill is what's missing. You can use a speech API, for example, in my case, or all options are correct. So what do people say? How do you transcribe speech? Let's say 
I could say maybe the easiest way. So he's using a speech API. So a lot of people were on the right, as opposed to like collecting audio data, training and predict with it is much more complex. You can use a speech API and then you can train, you can transcribe speech from there. So you see, this is kind of like, the, sorry, the experience that you will be seeing during the, off, uh, the office hours. We're going to be practicing exam uh, questions like this. We're going to be giving context of why maybe you answer it that way and so on. So I hope you guys had a lot of fun. This is exactly what we're going to be doing. I'm going to stop the uh, I'm going to stop the quiz, of course. And yeah, um, we uh, we don't need to do any of that. So I'm just going to uh, reset and that. And then we're going to we're going to pick it up again when we do uh, again our our office hours. Awesome. So, OK, now let's uh, let's uh, now do the raffle so that we can wrap it up. I use uh, what is it? Uh, Wheel of Names. That's the website that I use. Wheel of Names. Hope that. OK, yeah, there it is. So for Wheel of Names, what we're going to do, we're going to pick one name out of everybody. We're going to then raffle one of the items that I mentioned. Let me go all the way back up. That way you can see it. So we're going to be raffling one item out of the Google Cloud merchandise store. So you can pick one. If you win, if you're in the U.S. or Canada, you pick one of these, we'll, uh, the Google uh, merchandise store will ship it to you. If you're not, then we're going to send you a $25 Amazon gift card, uh, again, as a token of our appreciation. So time for raffle. Let's now... Uh, again, remember, you pick one of these if you win. So good luck to everybody. Uh, again, before we wrap it up, uh, Kevin, do you, you know, you want to say something while I collect names or anything? Uh, yeah, so basically I collected all the vote files that so we're going to be adding to this, uh, the tracker so that the next time you open up, you see them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. So for those of you, last minute, if you want to add your name to the raffle link, uh, I can actually take one more in the next 30 seconds if you're not. So I'm going to drop it one more time. Uh, if you did not fill out the, uh, the form for the raffle, I'm going to give you one last chance. I'll drop it right here in the chat. Add your name. If you're not, if, if not, if you are already, that your name is there. Don't worry. But make sure that if you, if you haven't added your name, please add it. Again, on behalf of GDG Lawrence, thank you so much for joining this session. Make sure to focus on week two if you're up to date. So we should be, remember, at this uh, in week two. So we're going to focus on TensorFlow and the Google Cloud feature engineering for August 21st. So you have two weeks to then complete those two badges. If you're not up to date, then now you have those four badges, week one and week two, to complete. Okay. So now I, okay, so now let me pick up the names one more time. Let's put it in there. And I wish uh, luck to everybody. Let's just grab everybody's names. We'll drop it here. And again, good luck to everybody. If your name gets picked and you're in the USA or Canada, uh, we're going to reach out to you via email if you win. And then we're going to, uh, uh, you can pick again from one of these items and then we're going to ship it to you. Okay. All right. Uh, now let's spin and good luck to everybody. I'll spin it right now and good luck to everybody. Let's see who wins the swag from the Google cloud store. And the winner is Ruben Wang. Ruben Wang, are you in the chat oh that's another thing you need to be in the chat in order to win so are you there oh Ruben. okay thank you thank you so much Ruben. uh yes so we're gonna reach out to you uh via email that way uh then we can ship you your item you can then pick start thinking what you want out of the t-shirt socks hat or mug and then you can uh, pick from there. We're going to ship it to you. Okay. So we'll reach out to you uh, offline. But uh, in the meantime, again, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you, everybody. I just, I'll put up actually the thank you slide. That way you guys can see it. So again, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, what we usually do at the end is we take a picture out of everybody. If anybody, if, for example, I'm going to stop sharing. And if you don't mind, we can uh, you open up the camera. And then we take a screenshot uh, out of everybody. So I see a lot of great familiar faces. Hey, John, how you doing, buddy? 
Enrique, Maxime, Melanie, uh, Vivek right there, Kevin, of course, William. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of a lot of folks. Awesome. Thank you. Everybody. Oh, now more faces are opening of the cameras. I love that. So stay right there while I take a few screenshots. And why don't you, while you're opening your cameras, you have to do the GDG symbol, which is this. Again, I promise it's not a gang sing. It's got it's not a gang sign. This is the GDG symbol. This brings us together. This is the logo of the GDG uh, community, okay? So while you do that, I'll take a few screenshots. Just smile, look at the camera. We'll take a few screenshots. Let's do that. Just one second. I don't second. know, Roman. I think this is a gang sign. <laughs> That's awesome. Let's try another one. Okay, I know we have another page of folks. Uh, keep looking, keep looking. Keep looking. I'm taking the screenshot, saving it. Perfect. And one last one. Stay right there. I'll take a screenshot. Awesome and good. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. We'll see you on the next session. Remember, August 21st for week two. I hope to see you there. Thank you again, Kevin. Thank you again, all the communities who made this possible. Have a great two weeks. Uh, continue pushing forward. Join our Slack channel. Ask us any questions. Uh, and we'll see you in the next session then. Thank you. So, Thank you so uh, much. Roman, we have to talk this our session next week, right? No, uh, uh, not for next week. It's after session two. So not next week. Okay. But people will get the notification. I hope they get the notification. So thank you again. Thank you again, Kevin, for, for being here uh, and everybody for joining. Have a great night. See you on the next Have session. Great night. Thank you for coming. Thank you.